you all for making time to come today and learn about home care in Texas. Thank Julie and Ann and Joe for planning the conference and working their tails off to put it together, host and organize. I was asked today to talk about the Texas Advanced Directives Law, and even though I'll talk about the Texas problem, please be confident, like Julie said, euthanasia and imposed death, and I don't really like the term physician-assisted suicide because that's imposed death too. But these are real problems, not only in Texas, but in every hospital, in every state, in every care facility. Under the Texas law, it's called the feudal care law, the futility law, the 10-day law, it has lots of names, but we call it the Texas Advanced Directives Act. A doctor or hospital can start the process to withdraw your care by giving the patient or the family 48 hours notice that we're ha they're having an ethics committee meeting. Now some people would welcome this news thinking, okay, I'm going to go before a board of philosophers and clergy and nurses to talk about the ethics or the medical ethics either being denied or afforded to my ailing loved one. However, I've been to many of these ethics committee meetings with patients as their advocate. That is not the case. What happens is the committee rubber stamps the decision that's made by the hospital or the person who has initiated the 10-day process. And so what happens is you will get a notice or a verbal notice saying in 48 hours we're going to have this meeting. Here's why we're going to have this meeting, because you have requested care that we think is inappropriate. And they'll give you a bunch of paperwork when they give you the notice of the 48 hours meeting that explains the law and that explains, gives a copy of the statute, explains the law, and then also on that list in the paperwork is a list of people or entities or organizations that have signed up with the Department of Health in Texas to help families or patients navigate this feudal care process. And Texas Right to Life is on that list. But neither the physician nor the facility is obligated to treat the patient beyond the 10th day. So when we go to the meetings, there's a discussion, it's really a one-sided discussion, about you've asked for this treatment, here's the situation your loved one is in. They talk about the patient as if the patient is already dead, as if the patient is the worst burden on the planet and they sort of villainize the family as if the family is so unreasonable to be asking for continued treatment for the patient and then usually after the meeting a letter is given to the family and my experience has been that the letter is pre-written before the meeting we have decided that the treatment you're requesting is inappropriate and therefore you have 10 days and they're again given the stack of paperwork that states the law, the law that allows doctors and hospitals to summarily withdraw treatment against the wishes of the patient, against the wishes of the family, and even if the patient has written a legally executed advanced directive. Our experience has been that patients who are conscious and can speak for themselves, patients who are disabled, patients who are not terminal, patients who have all ranges of insurance, only a handful of the patients Texas Right to Life has helped has had no insurance. So compared to over 200 patients, maybe three or four have had no insurance whatsoever. Our patients have ranged in age from four months old to 91 years old. And they're all socioeconomic and racial backgrounds. I point that out so that you understand no one is safe in a Texas hospital. The problem is that the Texas law fosters and sort of encourages doctors to make, or care providers, to make decisions about the person's quality of life as futile versus the medical treatment as futile. If you get sick in Texas, you need to go to Oklahoma as fast as you can. The Texas law authorizes providers to override and ignore a patient's wishes surprises the families with the 48 hours notice, empowers an unchecked and unaccountable committee. Families are ripped away from the bedside of their ailing loved one because now they're caught up in a legal and political battle with the hospital and the people who are in the room caring for the patient at 10 a.m. have now had this meeting and turned against the patient at by 3 p.m. 
So you can imagine this frenzy into which the families are thrown, and they're quite upset. An unelected body of so-called experts are the ones who serve on this ethics committee, and they're usually on the hospital payroll. So clearly they have a conflict of interest. And patients are like you and me. They just have various differing medical needs or disabilities, and the families are not unreasonable. The families just don't want to speak the death of their loved ones. Most of the families who call Texas Right to Life for help recognize that the patient is not going to pick up his or her mat and leave the hospital on his, his or her own two legs. But they are very uncomfortable with the pressure put upon them to end the life of their loved one. So the families simply realize they don't want to speak the death of the loved one, even though they realize their loved one may be dying or is maybe sick, quite sick. The medical community is banking on the fact that we don't understand their terms. Julie talked about this a little bit. And so the words are very, very important. When someone says, oh, she'll never recover, well, what do you mean by never? And exactly how do you know? And the term brain death is terrible. Brain death is nothing more than an excuse to harvest organs or kill a patient, if not both. Every set of criteria that has come out on brain death is less rigid and less protective than the one before. At Texas Right to Life, we prefer to use terms like minimally conscious or unconscious or semi-conscious or even a quiescent brain. Because unless you have complete and total irreversible cessation of all brain activity combined with cardiopulmonary death, your patient's still alive. You might be unconscious, but if your physiological functions are still happening, then the soul has not left your body. You are still integrated, even though you might be brain damaged or quiescent.